let's talk about an introduction to options, futures, derivatives, uh, and commodities. And I also want to talk about why oil is at a two-year high and why the price of oil in the futures market went negative, negative oil in 2020. So what I'll also do is I'll briefly explain how the future market works uh, using props as always. Uh, and what I'm about to teach you is an excerpt from my upcoming uh, Udemy course called uh, the Complete Options, Futures and Derivatives course. Again, please laugh at me and not with me as I'm about to make a fool of myself for a change. Now, before we get started, if you want to experiment with transacting in options, you can open a paper account portfolio. So right now I'm in simulated trading. Okay, this is a paper portfolio here. And right here, um, and I'm doing this for my, my, my course coming up soon, I have Coca-Cola options, okay? And you can actually look at Coca-Cola options. Uh, you can see which calls are in the money and which puts are in the money. Uh, a call and a put is, is the option for you to be able to buy a certain number of shares after a limited amount of time. Um, calls means you bet a small amount of money, the stock's gonna go up. The worst you can lose is this much money. Puts is when you bet this much money that the stock's going to go down. Worst case, you lose this much money. Don't short stocks because your losses can be infinite. Now, options, as the word states, is optional. Meaning, if you buy an option, you have the option. It's optional. You have the option of executing it. Futures markets are similar, but unlike options, you must execute the contract. Okay. And people have been trading futures contracts on commodities uh, like corn, uh, wheat, and even uh, tulip bulbs for hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of years. But most people invest in stocks to make money. But the size of the options, futures, uh, derivatives market in general it is massive. Okay. It's over $600 trillion. It's so big and it affects many aspects of our lives. And it can make us a lot of money like stocks do, or it can protect us from losing money, which is one of the reasons why the global derivatives market is six times bigger than the size of the global stock market. In fact, if you added up the value of, of all the securities that all derivative contracts are based on, then the value is bigger than the GDP, meaning revenue of every country in the world. In fact, if, if you go back to 2008, when the whole world was, was within 24 hours of bank machines not working, um, it was because of derivatives. And at that time, I remember well, Warren Buffett saying that derivatives are financial weapons of mass destruction. So let's go on a journey together, okay? Let's go on a journey together uh, uh, back in time to 1896. Top of the morning to ya! My name is Farmer Marty McFly. I have all these bushels of wheat here and I want to sell them. And I got to put this wheat on a train and it takes me seven days on a train to arrive at the market in Chicago where somebody will buy the wheat. I'm gonna, okay, lose the accent, Haroon, here we, here we go. The price of wheat changes all the time. And I, Farmer McFly, I'm worried that if I ship this wheat and somebody buys it in seven days when it, when it arrives off the train, I'm worried that in seven days, if the price of wheat falls below $1, then I won't be able to keep my farm. So I need prote to protect my farm and my family, and I'm not sure what to do. My name is John Pierpont Morgan. My friends call me JP Morgan, but you can call me Mr. Morgan. And I can help you. I came here in the nick of time. I can help you as I will buy your wheat. I will buy your wheat now for $1, even though it won't arrive on the train when you ship it for seven days in the future. And the futures and derivatives markets is, are all about time. Mr. Morgan, Farmer McFly. Mr. Morgan, I cannot thank you enough. May you live as long as you want and never want as long as you live. Now, please tell me what happens if the price of this wheat falls to 50 cents from $1 in seven days. Well, you still get $1 no matter what happens. If it drops below $1, I bite the bullet and I take the loss. But if the price rises way above $1, you still only get $1 and I get a handsome profit. Gee whiz. Well, from a risk reward perspective, if the price falls below $1, me farm will go belly up and I will go broke. But at $1, 
I have the insurance in place to stay in business. So as a seller of wheat, I am happy, farmer, I'm happy to sign the $1 contract. Okay, we're back in the present now. Now, who would buy this wheat? Well, the other side of the futures transaction are usually big companies that need wheat uh, to make their products. For example, uh, General Mills, ticker GIS, uh, they need to buy wheat in order to make their cereal Wheaties. Okay, so they're the counterparty or the other side of that trait. Okay, they want to lock in a price as well. And the Olympic hero uh, on this box is Michael Phelps, who won 65 gold medals in, in the Olympics. Now, just like with wheat, there are markets where you can buy and sell based on the future price of anything like gold, for example, like his gold medals. And, and that's actually how uh, Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd made a fortune in the classic movie about futures called uh, Trading Places. Now, there are ways to buy and sell the future price of almost anything, including hemp now and, and cannabis, which I don't partake in. And here, interesting side note, actually, <laughs> General Mills no longer has Michael Phelps on the cover of Wheaties because he was, he was caught smoking weed. So if I worked in the marketing department at Wheaties, I guess I might change the cover of this box to, you know, winners don't do drugs. Champions do. Okay, sorry. It's been a while since I put up dad humor on this call. Okay, we're, we're done with the Wheaties for now. So Farmer McFly's uh, wheat contract is part of the Chicago Mercantile Group. Okay. Uh, and, and that actually, uh, the CME, I should say, Farmer McFly's wheat contract is part of the CME Group which stands for the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And think of the CME like it's a combination of the NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange. And the CME, or Chicago Mercantile Exchange, is enormous. And I humbly think that it has a near monopoly. You know, it's like if Walmart and Amazon merge and control the options, futures, and derivatives markets. Now, here at the CME, what you can do is you could scroll down and you can get futures and prices on wheat and all different products, right? So it's kind of tough to see, but right here, you've got a soybean, you've got cattle, and these are live, these are trading right now. You've got uh, corn futures, crude oil, uh, equities as, as well, okay? So it's, it's a massive, massive business, but there's actually one exchange in the world, one future exchange that trades more every day in terms of options and futures volume, uh, which is the National Stock Exchange uh, of India in Mumbai. Now, what I just explained to you uh, with Mark Farmer McFly was a futures contract, which is kind of like an, an insurance policy, okay? It, the, insurance po policy, the insurance policy protects the farmer from changes in the price of wheat. And that futures contract gave the farmer peace of mind, whew, knowing that if the price of wheat dropped, he'd still be able to take, car to get, take care of his farm and his family. So that wheat futures contract was kind of like an insurance policy for him. And this is actually not a new concept because thousands of years ago, uh, in what is now Italy, olive oil companies also did the same thing. And in the 1600s in Holland, when tulip bulb prices were rising, locked in prices to sell tulip bulbs at certain prices or higher prices in the future, just in case the price dropped, okay? And there have been so many investment bubbles over the past thousand years uh, in options and futures and derivatives financial instruments have actually uh, made people a fortune or helped them to lock in prices in order to protect their investments. Let's talk about another example now. We're going to do another case study, but this time we're going to go back to 2003. We're going to go to Texas. My name is Gary Kelly, and I'm the, the chief financial officer at a Texas-based airline company called Southwest, ticker LUV. Everything's bigger in Texas, everything. Even this shirt, it's huge. Now, we at, at, at Southwest Airlines, ticker LUV, we love to hedge our risk when thinking about the future price of our, of our expenses in general. And back in 1972, the year that Professor Chris Heroin was born, we almost went bankrupt here at Southwest, okay? And we had to actually sell one of our Boeing 737 airplanes so we can make payroll. And we learned the hard way that we must think about future expenses if we're going to remain in business. So today, today is 2003. So 
what do you think our biggest expenses are to run our airline? What do you think it is? It's oil. And what keeps most airlines in the red, meaning they lose money, is when the price of oil increases. Okay, so remember we're back in 2003, I'm the CFO of Southwest. Now, over the past couple of years, we've been spending over 20% more on oil and our ticket prices have actually slightly dropped. And so it's 2003 now and China is growing so gosh darn fast that they keep buying more and more oil. And since I live in the great state of Texas, my old oil buddies here tell me that the price of oil is going to increase from the current price of 28 bucks to over 100 bucks in five years, which is what happened. This ain't my first rodeo. I know what's going to happen. The price of oil will increase and we will go bankrupt. So how do I lock in the price of oil at a low price so that we can make a lot of money while sure enough, the other airlines go belly up? Well, there's a concept called hedging. By hedging against a big increase in the price of oil so we can be profitable and in the black, bless your heart, don't mess with Texas. I sure hope this works. It worked exceptionally well, exceptionally well, right? It was, it was amazing uh, to the extent that the CFO, um, uh, Gary, Gary Kelly eventually became the CEO. There we go. He eventually became the, the, the CEO of, of Southwest Airline, which rarely happens. C CFOs usually don't make CEO, but you're going to love what I'm about to tell you here. Southwest made billions of dollars because their hedges, especially uh, with their hedges, because the price of oil was well over $100 at one point in 2008, right? But remember, they, they were paying just under 30 bucks for it per barrel. So how do many airlines protect themselves from an increase in the price of oil? Well, they do it by calling their friends that work at big banks like JP Morgan. And they ask their friends when they call them to structure a financial product that will give them the option to buy oil over the next couple of years or longer at a certain price. Now, unlike futures contracts, you don't have to buy oil at a certain price. Okay. But you have the option to do so. Okay. That's the difference between options and futures. And in my, my course, I'll, my upcoming course on Udemy, I'll, I'll talk about that in much more detail. Okay. So a futures contract is set in stone as the buyer and the seller must execute the contract uh, that we talked about uh, with the price of wheat, for example, with Farmer McFly. With the farmer's future contract, once he signed the contract, he had to sell wheat for a buck per bucket, a dollar per bucket. And JP Morgan had to buy the wheat for a dollar per barrel. Options are a bit different because as the name options implies, you have the option to buy or sell at certain prices. Now, oil is at a two year high. And why the heck did the price of oil in the futures market go negative for the first time in history in April of 2020? Well, the price of oil dropped one day in April of 2020 by more than 300%. Okay, this is nutty. It went from $18 to negative $38.45. Crazy. And that actually was the mother of all black swan events. Oil went negative. And the reason it did go negative last year was because there were so many oil tankers sitting out there full of oil. Okay, and there's no demand for oil. And it costs a lot of money. It, it recovered quickly in June, of course. But let me just talk about the bigger picture here. The wonderful thing uh, about uh, options and futures is it's all about making money based on the change in price of something in the future. Okay. Or it's all about protection, meaning defense. Okay. So let me, let me use a, a, a sports analogy. Okay. In the world of sports, we talk about offense and defense. You know, offense is scoring a touchdown or a goal or, or making money. Defense is about protecting yourself from somebody scoring against you. So all this stuff that I'm talking about when it comes to options, meaning futures, etc., is about either being offensive, meaning making money, or being defensive, meaning protecting your money. Okay, and, and that's why the market is so much bigger than the stock market. And so all this stuff 
meaning options and futures are part of the bigger derivatives industry. And there's even more advanced types of derivatives that I'll talk about in my upcoming course. Again, the size of the entire derivatives market is way, way, way over $600 trillion. Okay. It's six times bigger than the value of all stocks in the world combined. And people use all sorts of derivative instruments when it comes to making money or protecting against losing money. Okay. And, and they do this with, um, with commodities, bonds, stocks, interest rates, currency fluctuations, etc. Now on a much more serious note, derivative instruments are analyzed closely by government agencies like the FBI and the Securities and Exchange Commission to catch criminal hedge funds from profiting off of insider information. What does this mean? Well, if a hedge fund buys a lot of call options on a company, okay, and that company gets acquired by another company, it could signal to the government that the hedge fund had insider information, which of course is against the law. Also, governments analyze many organizations globally whenever somebody profits from stocks or they go down a lot, okay? Right, in size with weird events. Now, I worked at Goldman Sachs on 9-11 in New York City. It was awful. A week or two uh, after 9-11, when we were allowed to go back to work and the markets opened, they were in free fall, of course. And on the trading floor, I'll never forget this, a couple weeks after 9-11, okay? On the trading floor, on my Bloomberg Financial Data Terminal, I entered UAL Equity OMON and AA Equity OMON, which means I looked at the options monitor OMON for two stocks, okay? United Airlines and American Airlines, right? UAL ticker and AA ticker. And the opposite of, of a call is called a put, meaning you can invest money and make money if stocks go down. And nobody talks about this, but I noticed, and it's publicly disclosed if you want to let, do research on it, but I noticed at that time that a few days before 9-11, the amount of put options purchased on the U.S. airlines was the highest it's been in history. It, it's terrifying. But when it comes to derivative instruments, governments use artificial intelligence-based products to analyze who is profiting from awful events, which of course I'm happy that the government is, is monitoring. Now the global derivative market impacts all of us. And it was actually one of the reasons why the world was, was within 24 hours of bank machines not working in 2008. And I'll explain, I'll explain more about this thoroughly in my upcoming course as we build upon the basics uh, and advanced topics of, of derivatives. But the macro implications of using derivative instruments affects our daily lives a lot. Now, one last thing I wanna talk about from a macro, meaning bigger picture perspective, is the best damn indicator for you to know when to buy stocks, okay? And we're looking at a derivative instrument in a second together. It's really simple, okay? Now, one of the many derivative markets we'll discuss in the course is the CBOE, which is the Chicago Board Options Exchange. And on the CBOE, okay, and we're gonna go there in a second, is a very important ticker, which is the VIX, V-I-X, okay? Which measures expectations of future volatility uh, in the Standard & Poor's 500 Index, okay? And the Standard & Poor's 500 Index also called the S&P 500. It's basically a collection of 500 stocks that represent the U.S. markets, okay? So I'll talk about many international markets as well, of course, in the course, not just the U.S. Now on the CBOE, the ticker VIX measures how volatile the market expects the S&P 500 to be. And volatility is fear, right? So when people are scared, stocks go up and down a lot, very volatile, it's a fear indicator. And I love backing up the truck and buying stocks when the VIX spikes a lot, okay? This, this works exceptionally well, I'm about to show you, okay? So let me show you this, and I will type here VIX. Okay, great, here it is. Oops, actually type in ticker VIX, V-I-X. Here we go, good. All right, so let's take a look at this, and I promise you what I'm about to show you is going to make you a fortune if you do it right, and I'll explain Okay, so the VIX was first launched back in 1990, okay? And whenever the VIX spikes, it means there's fear. Volatility increases a lot on the S&P 500, right? 
And so it's, it's tough to see, uh, but right here, uh, this is around Gulf War One, okay? Uh, and there was fear in the markets, right? Here, uh, in, in the late 90s, I worked at Goldman Sachs here. And I remember it was Federal, uh, Federal Reserve Chairperson uh, Alan Greenspan uh, unexpectedly cut rates and the trading floor went nuts. I'll never forget it. Um, and that was because of the Asian uh, flu. Nothing to do with, with COVID, but back then there was a lot of problems with, with a lot of Southeast Asian countries, okay? So the market sold off and, and the VIX was high. Then it spiked again, of course, uh, after 9-11. Uh, and then in 2008, it spiked uh, right here. And you always buy stocks when the VIX spikes a lot, okay? I promise you it works. It works exceptionally well. It's foolproof. That's right, for now at least, yeah. Um, and when the VIX spikes, I promise you, you're going to be sitting there thinking, oh my God, it's crazy. It's crazy to think I should buy stocks now because the world's ending. It's not. Things are never as bad as they seem, always. But that's when you back up the truck because nobody else is. And so the VIX spiked to 79.13 in October 2008. And the VIX last year, if we look at it, uh, if you looked intraday last year, it actually spiked to above 80. Let's see if I can show it here. Yeah, yeah. It spiked temporarily to 82.69. And so what you need to do is always be unemotional and back up the truck whenever the VIX spikes, no matter what, okay? Because as Warren Buffett once said, the New York Stock Exchange, the only store in the world where consumers sell stuff when it goes on sale, meaning when the VIX is very, very high. And in my upcoming course, um, I'll also teach you uh, about incredibly profitable trades that worked well for George Soros when he made a billion dollars in one day. I'll also teach you about disastrous trades that ruined companies and economies. Like when Nick Leeson, who is a trader in Singapore, used derivatives and bankrupted the second oldest merchant bank called Barings back in 1999. Yeah. I'll also talk about how derivatives brought the entire global financial market to near extinction in 2008. And I'll talk about how the whole world was literally within 24 hours of bank machines not working.